Warning, the video that you are about to review contains graphic violence, obscene language, and disturbing images that should only be viewed by informed and consenting adults. 100% of all of the violence, obscene language, and disturbing images contained in this video has been perpetrated by the Pennsylvania State Troopers in their official capacities as police officers. Hello, my name is Larry Hohall. I am a former Pennsylvania police officer and a graduate of the Pennsylvania State Police Academy for Municipal Officers. I am also the author of a nonfiction book about judicial corruption in Pennsylvania. Since I wrote my book, countless people have approached me from all over the United States requesting help with their corruption issues. This case stands out from all that I have reviewed to date. Not because of the claims made, not because of the outrageous actions of those in power, not because it is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. It stands out for two reasons. The first is the absolute proof of the crimes committed by the Pennsylvania State Police. Secondly, and as importantly, the complicity and cover-up by all involved, including the State Police Oversight Mechanism, which is known as the Bureau of Integrity and Professional Standards. It is my hope that this video will outrage you to the point of taking action. But for the grace of God, this could have been your child or family member that these horrific acts happened to. Please keep in the back of your mind as you watch this presentation that as of the date of this final production of this video, the state troopers you are about to see are still strapping on their guns and pinning on their badges to officially protect and serve. You had better hope you or one of your loved ones never crosses paths with any of these Pennsylvania's finest. Early on the evening of March 8, 2010, 31-year-old Robert Leone of Vestal, New York, finished up a session of stargazing at the Copernic Observatory, which is about a 10-minute ride from his home. He was feeling particularly happy that evening. His life was in order. He had just gotten his driver's license back after being suspended for a non-accident DUI charge. He had gone cold turkey on his drinking for over a year, and the medication his doctor prescribed for his bipolar condition offered him some relief. An early evening drive in the country while listening to his favorite music seemed to be just the right thing to top off his evening. This drive would change his life forever. With his car's T-top open and his heater turned up full blast, his odyssey began. He crossed the border into Pennsylvania, which on a rural road simply consists of a small marker on the side of the road. Driving through the small town of Tawanda, Pennsylvania, he was approached from behind by a Pennsylvania State Police car with its lights flashing. There was plenty of room for the trooper to pass him on his left and simply go around but for some reason the trooper did not. The trooper then sounded his patrol car siren, but still did not pass. Not knowing what was going on, Bob Leone became startled and confused. His reaction was no different than the confusion of an elderly person not knowing what to do in this situation. His bipolar condition added to his uncertainty. The thought that maybe he should pull over never entered his mind. In his mind, he had done nothing wrong. He wasn't speeding, he didn't go through any red lights or stop signs, and he simply became bewildered by the fact that the trooper would not pass him and go to whatever emergency he was obviously being directed to. Mr. Leone deducted, when the trooper finally decided to pass him, he simply would, and that would be the end of it. Mr. Leone lit another cigarette and turned up his music so he could hear it over the siren. Mr. Leone continued driving towards his home at the blazing breakneck speed of 5 to 10 miles an hour under the posted speed limit. He noticed in his mirror that a second, third, fourth, and fifth police car was now apparently responding to the same emergency as the first trooper who still had not passed him. 
you and I know for a fact that if there was any question in our minds as to what the state troopers were up to, we would have simply pulled over long before now. I have been told that persons with bipolar conditions don't always think the way non-bipolar people do. They often rationalize their actions incorrectly. Mr. Leone knew he hadn't done anything wrong, so he was simply going to drive home and listen to his music. Other than not pulling over, Mr. Leone did not break a single traffic law. He did not speed, he did not attempt to elude, he didn't pass through any red lights or stop signs. This was simply a low speed chase, which at least one of the troopers involved became bored and distracted, as evidenced by his onboard video. The dash cam video you are about to view has been edited for this presentation, but is available in its entirety. Instead of a trooper pulling a car in front of Mr. Leone and stopping him, a much more radical method was deployed. Stop sticks and ramming was the method of choice. Watch this car. It is later confirmed by the sworn statements of two of the troopers that this car was parked in such a fashion as to totally block the driver's door of Mr. Leone's car. It was blocked in such a fashion that the state trooper himself had to climb out his own window in order to exit the vehicle. Although I cannot attest to the trooper's mindset at this time, it appears as though the trooper has decided there is no mortal threat as he clearly holsters his service weapon. By the trooper's own sworn statements, this trooper orders Mr. Leone to exit his vehicle three or four times. Mr. Leone cannot open his car door because of the trooper's car blocking it. He is then tasered by the trooper through the open sunroof. All sworn statements by all of the troopers involved agree that just prior to Mr. Leone being tasered, he was sitting calmly with both hands on his steering wheel smoking a cigarette. As Mr. Leone is removed through the passenger door, watch how Corporal Stipak positions himself on the roof of the car. Note that he does not exit the roof and then assist his fellow troopers in handcuffing Mr. Leone. Rather, he jumps directly onto Mr. Leone with both feet while Mr. Leone is face down on the ground. This maneuver is known as a monkey stomp and is not taught as a valid maneuver in the police academy. We can't see a lot of what is going on behind Mr. Leone's passenger door, but sworn testimony from the troopers involved all state that Mr. Leone is face down with his hands under him. If you look closely under the car door, it will appear that from time to time you can see Mr. Leone's body bounce as he is being struck, kicked, and tasered. At no time is Mr. Leone seen striking or attempting to strike any of the officers. Mr. Leone still has taser probes in him and the troopers testify he is being shocked multiple times while he is being beaten and kicked or in their words subdued. The troopers claim Mr. Leone is fighting so viciously at this point that later on they charge him with three felony counts of aggravated assault on a police officer. I have watched this segment dozens of times 
And as hard as I look, I just don't see it. One of the troopers breaks his own hand by admittedly punching Mr. Leone in the head with it. Striking or punching a suspect in the head with a closed fist is not taught in the police academy and is a maneuver that is specifically addressed as not authorized. As a former police officer, my experience has taught me that when people lie to cover up wrongdoing, they often lie about the unimportant issues with as much conviction as the important ones. In other words, they embellish the small issues to make the big issues look more believable. Here is an excerpt from the official internal investigation of this matter. The signed sworn affidavit accompanying this statement reads as follows. I, Trooper Andrew J. Burian, verify that I was given the opportunity to review the above information and that I was allowed to make any corrections or clarifications. By placing my signature in the space provided below, I verify that the above summation accurately reflects my observations of the events regarding this incident. His statement reads as follows. The suspect was still uncooperative and wouldn't walk to the car. Something so simple, but it is a lie. As you will see, Mr. Leone did cooperate and voluntarily walked to the car. There is so much wrong at so many different levels with what you have just seen. Unfortunately, things are about to get worse for Mr. Leone. Although we cannot see what is about to happen in the back of this state police car, we can clearly hear what is said and done as the audio track of this dash cam recorded it all. Additionally, nowhere in this video is Mr. Leone advised of his constitutional rights. In the next sequence, he is clearly questioned and beaten while handcuffed and hogtied by the state trooper. If Mr. Leone had just committed a horrendous crime before he was stopped and answered the trooper's questions as he was directed to do by the trooper, none of his admissions would have been allowed in court. In other words, when questioned by the trooper, if Mr. Leone stated he had just murdered five people, his admission could not be used because basic, mandatory police procedure was not followed. As bad as things have been for Mr. Leone so far, it would have been a gift from God if this were the end of it. Once again, things are about to get much worse for Mr. Leone. Much, much worse. Huh? I'm in a 
Listen carefully as we replay the point in the video where the trooper claims Mr. Leone spits on him. Listen carefully. You will find something important is missing. The trooper claims in sworn court testimony that Mr. Leone spits a, quote, loogie in his face. Nowhere is there a sound of anyone spitting anything. The audio is so clear that you can hear Mr. Leone's breathing, but no spitting sounds are present. As a matter of fact, the only thing you do hear is a totally compliant and submissive prisoner in tremendous pain and an out-of-control state trooper. Mr. Leone is willing to take a polygraph test and swear under oath that he did not spit on this trooper. Let's say for argument purposes that a shackled prisoner does spit on a police officer. It now begs the question, does a police officer have the right to beat a prisoner that is shackled and in custody even if the prisoner spits on him? The obvious answer is no. If you recall earlier in the video, an ambulance has been requested to transport Mr. Leone to the hospital. Instead, when the ambulance shows up, the trooper with the broken hand is transported to the hospital in the ambulance 
and Mr. Leone is kept hogtied in the back of the patrol car. He is then transported to the hospital in the car with a stop along the way at the barracks. Please try to visualize what I am about to read to you from the official hospital report of Mr. Leone's first visit. And yes, I said first visit. Patient was carried to triage room by police. Patient's hands were with handcuffs and patient's feet were tied together with a rope and the rope was also tied to the patient's handcuffs. It goes on. Patient is awake and cooperative with an effect that is calm. As you can see from the hospital report, Mr. Leone is both cooperative and submissive with the emergency personnel. At one point, when the troopers are outside the examination room, he quietly tries to tell the nurse that the police have been beating him, and he begs her for help. One of the troopers overhears Mr. Leone's plea. All of the hospital personnel are ordered out of the exam room by the trooper, and a second beating and tasering episode is commenced. Mr. Leone is silenced. Video evidence of this second beating may be available through hospital video, which is still being explored. Naturally, the trooper's version of this incident is totally different. Sworn court testimony verifies that Mr. Leone was tasered multiple times during this altercation, but the official computer taser report was not provided to Mr. Leone's defense even though it was requested. In the overall scheme of things, this beating is a very important event and I will reference it a little later on. This beating and the events leading up to it were witnessed by the nurse who was attending to Mr. Leone. It was explained to me that she was not brought into the trial to testify on Mr. Leone's behalf due to her extreme fear for her own personal safety. It was not Mr. Leone that she was afraid of. Mr. Leone was treated and released from the hospital and placed back into the custody of the troopers. Unfortunately, Mr. Leone was left the hospital in worse shape than he had arrived in. He was transported to the Tawanda barracks without incident. While at the barracks, Mr. Leone was processed and his official charges were typed up. In the troopers' trial testimony, they made it clear that he is calm and cooperative during this process. Some very strange and questionable things happen over the next few hours that will end up with Mr. Leone being transported back to the hospital. This time, he will be unconscious. While at the state police barracks, the troopers attempted to arraign Mr. Leone via internet video link with the on-call duty magistrate. Mr. Leone is warned ahead of time that he should not look into the camera and that he is not to say anything other than answer the judge's questions. Mr. Leone jumps at the chance to beg the judge for help once the video link is established. According to Mr. Leone, the troopers disconnected the video link and claimed it was a malfunction. This disconnect can be verified by the on-call duty magistrate. According to Mr. Leone, he is once again beaten and tasered. Things start to get real fuzzy from this point forward. They claim while Mr. Leone was being walked to the waiting patrol car in order to be transported to the prison, he tried to escape. The troopers claimed that Mr. Leone fought so viciously and violently, using only his feet, which were shackled at the time, that they had no choice but to mace him and repeatedly beat him into submission with their batons. Please take a look at the hospital diagram of Mr. Leone's injuries. All of the injuries noted on the assessment diagram are on Mr. Leone's back. Mr. Leone's vital signs are very alarming. His pulse rate is now 132. Respirations are 28 per minute 
and his blood pressure is a staggering 174 over 109. The triage report states, patient unable to explain events prior to his arrival to the ED. There are many conflicting statements made on this emergency department report, which will be discussed at a later date. One of the most concerning is an entry made at 6.10 a.m. The attending nurse states, patient is shaking and disoriented to time and events. It appears on the report that 26 minutes later, Mr. Leone is discharged from the hospital back into the custody of the troopers. According to this report, no blood was drawn, no urine was gathered, and no x-rays or CAT scans were performed. After being discharged from the hospital, Mr. Leone was transported by troopers to the Bradford County Correctional Facility. Officials at the prison were horrified by the condition of Mr. Leone when he arrived. The following image is graphic, so please prepare yourself for what you are about to see. This is an official mugshot taken by the prison of Mr. Leone that to my knowledge has not been altered in any way. Note that the prison used a vest of some sort to cover Mr. Leone's blood-covered clothing. I have seen prisoners of war that have been treated better. The officials were so alarmed that the on-call physician for the prison was called in to do a complete physical exam and documentation of Mr. Leone's injuries, lest they be blamed for any of his injuries going forward. Mr. Leone had high quality private health insurance when he was incarcerated. He begged the prison officials to allow him to obtain medical care at no charge to the prison or the county for severe headaches and dizziness that persist to this day. His requests were denied. At some point after Mr. Leone was incarcerated, he thinks he was arraigned. Regardless, it was well in excess of Pennsylvania's six-hour preliminary arraignment rule. Believe it or not, this story so far spans less than 24 hours. Mr. Leone's nightmare was just beginning. Mr. Leone's bail was set at $250,000, even though he was not a flight risk. He languished in prison for six months before his trial was conducted. His public defender was extremely overburdened with countless other cases, and the state police threw the book at Mr. Leone. 24 counts of criminal misconduct. There is an old saying, what you don't have in quality make up for in quantity, and that is exactly what the state police did. Remember the trooper that broke his hand on Mr. Leone's face while punching it? Well, Mr. Leone was charged with aggravated assault on a police officer for breaking that trooper's hand on his face. Remember when Mr. Leone was beaten and tased on the hospital stretcher? Well, he was charged with assaulting that trooper. The troopers also charged Mr. Leone with DUI, even though his blood test came back negative for alcohol or illegal drugs. I believe this case became so important to the state police that they convinced the district attorney of Bradford County to try the case himself as opposed to one of his underlings. It is a decision the district attorney would later regret. Regardless of the less than stellar defense, the jury read right through the state police and district attorney's smokescreen. Mr. Leone was found not guilty or had charges dismissed on 20 of the 24 charges. All of the serious charges were gone. It looked like Mr. Leone should have been sentenced to time served. That did not happen. Mr. Leone 
has been sentenced to one and a half to four years in prison and is still incarcerated. I believe with all of my heart that he will not be released until after the statute of limitations has expired on the crimes that have been committed against him. There is so much more to this story than time will permit in this video, but here are the main issues as I see them. An independent criminal investigation of this entire matter is in order. Not only were Mr. Leone's civil rights violated, but I believe the evidence clearly shows Mr. Leone was physically assaulted on numerous occasions by the state police. The Pennsylvania State Police Office of Integrity and Professional Standards needs to be independently investigated for criminal and civil liability for apparently covering up this entire matter. The fact that this internal investigation found no wrongdoing by any of the troopers involved here clearly indicates to me that the state police investigating themselves for any wrongdoing on any matter is really a bad idea. After reviewing the same dash cam video as you just did, I would have thought the district attorney of Bradford County should have taken pause with this case instead of jumping in with both feet to defend the actions of the state police. I believe there was an overt, well thought out attempt by the entire prosecution team to use the district attorney's high profile to influence the trial judge's rulings during this trial. And I believe they were successful at doing so as demonstrated by some serious verdict changing evidence that was denied to the defense. For instance, once the internal investigation was referenced to the jury by one of the troopers on the stand as proof of no wrongdoing by him or any other member of the state police, the defense was clearly entitled to a copy of this report. I suspect the trial judge denied defense access to this document because it contains some very serious defense aiding information. I also question the hospital releasing Mr. Leone back to the state police in the condition he was in after his second visit. Nowhere in their documentation does it show that Mr. Leone's vital signs stabilized and that he was out of danger. He very well could have died after his release and we would not be reviewing anything right now. Let me touch on the prison. Why on God's green earth would a prison deny Mr. Leone access to additional medical treatment while knowing full well he needed it and had health insurance to pay for it? Why is Mr. Leone still in prison? The warden of the Bradford County Correctional Facility has commented to Mr. Leone's parents that if all of the prisoners in his facility acted like Mr. Leone, he wouldn't need any guards. Yet Mr. Leone has been denied release from prison by the parole board twice since becoming eligible. The first denial was because they stated he did not take a drug and alcohol abuse class while incarcerated. If you remember, he was found not guilty of that charge. The second denial was because they lost the paperwork. I believe a more sinister reason is at play here. I believe the statute of limitations, time restrictions, in which Mr. Leone can bring both civil and criminal charges against the responsible parties is the driving factor. It is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to retain an attorney while you are in prison with no money. Call me tainted, but I have seen worse. A disturbing thought has consistently found its way to the forefront of my thought process while I put together this video. Mr. Leone didn't know his every action and every word 
was being recorded via a dash cam in the patrol car when he was first arrested. The troopers did. The troopers, who totally lost control of themselves, either didn't care that they were being recorded, or worse, they knew nothing would happen to them no matter how badly they acted. To me, this is chilling. As a former Pennsylvania police officer, I am here to tell you that the vast majority of police officers are compassionate, caring professionals. It is how we handle the officers who aren't that differentiates us from third world countries. Right now, it looks like Pennsylvania and its state police are operating as a third world country by allowing and covering up serious assaults against its citizens. The beating of shackled prisoners for any reason is not acceptable by anyone's standards. We are now at the end of a very emotional and disturbing review of what I consider to be a national scandal. I stated at the beginning of this video that but for the grace of God this could have been you or one of your family members. And now I will tell you why I made such a remark. Exactly why did the state police originally attempt to pull Mr. Leone over in the first place? Well, it appears they pulled over the wrong car that was involved in a minor fender bender. The fender bender in question was so minor that the state police never even filed an accident report for it. Imagine that. 